So Douglas, it's all yours. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I have um, a PowerPoint or PDF I'm gonna kind of use to follow uh, to kind of guide the discussion today. So let me uh, start bringing some things up. Uh, where's it at? That's not fun that I don't see that. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Um, so today, uh, what we're going to go through is uh, what I call a reimagined urban landscape. It's a artist book that I um, published back in 2018, of which I've had a chance to uh, take a look at and think about um, and what this uh, project could maybe really represent. I'll get into a little more details of what I was thinking at the time, but to kind of help maybe with um, setting the context, I also created a little video and I'm gonna do that to kind of give an, an opportunity for you to walk through the book. Uh, but I'm also going to uh, apologize to my West Coast Hollywood friends that uh, this video uh, is gonna look a little shaky and I probably should have had a um, track and dolly to, to film this, but I didn't. So uh, my apologies to my uh, filmmaking friends. And so let's do the stop share and let's go to the video. And since, uh, okay. Uh, so let me think about how this works. I will tell you that, um, all right, you begin playing. Okay, here we go. This, and also full screen. There we go, there. Should I, I'm gonna start, start over. Hold on, here we go. Start from scratch. There's the book. And now we're going to start going progressively through the interior pages. And I guess one thing that uh, you'll quickly realize is the book design is called a uh, Leparado, uh, where we here in the States call uh, an accordion book. And uh, in Italy, you would call it a consentina. So um, let me just allow it to go through. Sorry, no background music for this. And if I did, I'm not sure what I would have. <laughs> I will tell you that uh, this might be my very first filmmaking effort. Uh, and so the first time I filmed this, I had 
shoes on that did some scuffling with the carpet and realized I better take my shoes off. To, so I probably did this about four or five times trying to get it right. And for my Hollywood friends, this would be the fade out. Okay, cool. Up. Up. Uh, where are you all at? Up. Hold on. Well, we've got you. Oh, uh, for some reason. Oh, there we go. Okay, thanks. So uh, I'm trying to get this iMovie out of the way and voila, I'm back. Okay, so let's go back to, uh, that was a, a walkthrough of the book, kind of provide context. And so what I wanna do then is switch to this and to here. And I would like to, um, at this point, you full screen is to go through um, my new introduction for the book um, to help um, kind of explain why I did the revisual uh, uh, revisualization that I did. So uh, if it's okay, I'm just going to read this through. And that middle ground is a conceptual series that investigates aspects of anxiety, which affect me to various degrees and account for my panic attacks related to separation anxiety. This introspective investigation was not intended for this series or the book to begin with, but became a self-realization after the series was completed and published. I've only recently understood and accepted my ongoing anxieties stemming from events as an infant during and during my childhood. The COVID-19 pandemic compounded my issues to a point that my condition could no longer be ignored. And then to give some stats about uh, how many people in the US and globally are affected by anxiety. Um, also anxiety is uh, a person with anxiety, it's not readily obvious, but it's um, even to the person themselves, but it's rather a mysterious condition that can linger undetected for many years, my case in point. It can create havoc ranging from mild hypertension to, to life-threatening depression. The series contemplate, contemplates an urban landscape that resonates with my feelings of alienation, apprehension, uh, melancholy, and isolation. Uh, this continuous stretch of roadway functions as a borderland that elicits a personal sense of loss and this uh, melancholy. While representing my difficulties, constraints, and aspirations in creating personal connections, uh, the decorative oleander bushes, which to mark the highway's middle ground, are one of the world's most deadly plants. It may not be readily apparent that these botanical shrubs are also functioning as living barbed wire barriers, and that oleanders, like anxiety, are dangerous while hiding in plain sight. So, um, when I created this book, um, I did not have um, an essay that uh, described uh, my intent and what I was working on. So when I recently um, met with some folks, um, a curator and a, a gallerist down in, uh, down in San Diego, uh, they kind of, um, suggested that since this is a conceptual work, a lot of times having an introduction would really help. My problem was I'd already published the book. So 
it's like, how do I get this in there? And then it was like, oh, a very simple idea, uh, develop, print a introduction, and then um, add it as a loose sheaf, a loose page in the book, and which goes really nice. I think it's the next picture, is that uh, it's a stiff cover book that has what's called French folds for uh, the front cover. It's a different type of French fold in it. It folds up, but uh, this becomes then an ideal place for me to insert the loose sheet um, of paper uh, or page that describes uh, what you just read in terms of my introduction. So this was how um, the book uh, looks. And so, okay, I gotta need to go back to my notes here. <laughs> so uh, I found myself um, when I, okay. I'm really good, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do a segue here. I'm really good for workshops where I have a pretty programmed uh, coursework. Talking about myself is a bit of a struggle. So let me just say uh, from that standpoint, I'm gonna go back to my notes a little bit that I prepared for this. So as you saw, I am using an urban landscape as a metaphor for anxiety. And I created, created and looking at this as to how uh, you might understand how a person with anxiety, especially separation anxiety, might experience you know, the experiences they're going through and the struggles they have. And so part of what, um, in looking at the book, I also came to understand how the book can help with um, providing hope as well as a, a way out uh, in terms of managing anxiety. So it was a, a two-fold um, reimagining of this urban landscape um, because of the, really the idea that um, with anxiety as well as probably other mental health conditions, it's by far better to try to manage it than allow it to manage you. And so that's part and parcel as to how I'm hoping that as one reads through the book that they can come to uh, similar type conclusions. So how did kind of this all come about? Uh, when COVID um, broke and the pandemic started back a year and a half ago, um, let's just say that there was a lot of angst and part of which was I was having maybe a different type, if not more intense issues with what was going on. And long and short of it is that through a series of uh, discussions uh, uh, with some professionals, I came to find out that I myself had anxiety. And when I trace, we trace back to its or origins, it's, it occurred like long, long ago, but it so hardwired me that uh, I had not realized that this was something that I've been living with um, as a form of um, low-grade anxiety for essentially my entire life. Uh, what did come about were some infrequent panic attacks related to separation anxiety. And again, it wasn't until having some group discussions that even that became uh, something I was aware of. I just thought what I was doing was normal because this is how I always had reacted to certain situations. And uh, so when I came to realize the anxiety I was having, I also realized that this book that I had created back in 2018, which essentially the time was meant to be uh, a little bit of political satire um, regarding a president we had uh, who uh, was making a big deal about the border between the United States and Mexico. And I thought of this as 
uh, an attempted satire at kind of his foolishness. Uh, but what I also realized is that the issue on the border related to um, more strongly to uh, an issue of humanity. And therefore my project was probably a little too conceptual and too abstract as to how that related to the issues that the people were suffering and going through on the border. Um, when I published the book, uh, I was very fortunate. It resulted in a solo exhibit um, up in uh, Los Angeles at Fabric Projects. It uh, subsequently led to um, representation by the gallery. And we also did a, a limited edition publication through the gallery itself for a book plus print edition. But there was still something about the book that um, just didn't resonate as clearly with me. I, I in, in discussing this and having this looked by people that were a little bit more involved in politics, uh, they didn't get it. And so I kind of put it on hold for a while, um, back about the beginning of 2019, and I didn't really uh, promote the book or its sales uh, for a while. So fast forward, uh, the pandemic helped me with understanding uh, maybe what this book is really about um, with regard to uh, the separation of things. And then uh, as I kind of was continuing to struggle with what to do with the book, I was um, very impressed with what happened with Simone Biles during the Olympics and how she was able to uh, take a time out because of her own mental health conditions. She took, you know, stepped away from what was going on. But then after uh, kind of getting it all together, she came back again at the end of the week and went on to win a bronze uh, medal. And to me, that was very symbolic of issues that go on with people who have mental health issues that they will find themselves needing to take a time out. And in my case, my time out was pretty close to two and a half years. Um, so to me, that's um, sort of an indication as to uh, dealing with mental health, how, how long it might take for one to deal with the issues going on. So similar to uh, Simone Biles, doing a comeback, uh, that's where I realized that uh, I had a chance to uh, relaunch and, and uh, reinitiate this artist book with uh, the fact that it's now visualized um, the urban landscape in a different context. And by introducing the new introduction, I think it helps with kind of um, reframing how this body of work should be and, and looked at. Um, so when we looked at the book itself uh, in, the, in the photographs, uh, part of which was maybe good to go through now a little bit. Okay, so part of which is that um, the components of this book are, I think, three. That is, you have a foreground that um, well, you see the K-rails and the land and space uh, in front of. Uh, and a lot of times for what the subject is, uh, at this point, you probably realize it's the K rails as a separation for a freeway here in Southern California. This is in the North San Diego County. And so uh, you have all this debris in front, which to me is relates to the me messiness of life and uh, how things accumulate or uh, aren't cleaned up, but are also, as we look at some of the, some of the debris that uh, accumulates is accidental. It's not there by design, but it, it occurs. Then the second part of the uh, project is the 
uh, the middle ground itself, which is the K rail and the um, oleander, and how those things in the very beginning of the book uh, block all the sight. You, you, it's really hard to see what the subject is until as the book progresses, we see more and more of the background and through the oleander uh, at, the, at the freeway itself. Um, and then uh, the last part of the project relates to uh, what's, in, what's in the actual background itself, which um, is the, the city uh, of San Diego. And it's a very beautiful place. Uh, and it, uh, th there's well-kept well homes. Well, in the foreground, there are things that are, are nasty and really a mess. But beyond that, we can see something that is beautiful. It's a place where we want to be. Uh, and it uh, represents uh, something that's tantalizing. And for someone with anxiety, it actually symbolizes something that can be can be beyond the reach. And so it's like, okay, how do I get where I'm at here to over there when I've got to get through this mess that's in the middle? Um, so then as the series progresses, um, there's gaps and holes. And so part of which is that, um, and dealing with anxiety, sometimes you have some ups and downs and some spaces in between, but essentially um, it's these breaks in being able to see that far landscape is to provide uh, an idea that, that, that the barrier that's in front of you is perhaps of a size that's manageable that you can, you know, as, you, as we now know about K-rails, there's something you can climb over and you can get past. And so uh, it's meant to help with the fact that there's hope for uh, dealing with things like mental health, in my case, anxiety, is that I can get past this. Um, this one I thought was always kind of cool. And for some reason, uh, the sequence of having the cardboard and the arrow pointing the place to cross over uh, coincided. Uh, so I was uh, I always enjoy this particular photo. And by the way, uh, if you're wondering, yes, I had to actually stop on the freeway in the, in the actual fastest lane to take these pictures. So all of these were uh, photographed from the number four lane in the freeway. And because I tried taking pictures when the car was moving. Uh, that was problematic. So to resolve the problem, uh, I actually had to stop on the freeway to take these pictures, uh, which uh, can be very daunting and problematic. Uh, but it, I, I will also tell you that I'm not exactly crazy uh, because uh, if you're familiar with the North San Diego freeway early in the morning, it's also stop and go traffic for about 45 minutes. So I had plenty of opportunities in the stop and go traffic that when I stopped, I would turn and take a picture. And so that's kind of what facilitated my ability to um, compose and make these pictures. Uh, I will also say that um, I didn't always get a chance to stop at the exact spot that I wanted to, but I tell you what, if you travel that length of freeway in the morning traffic, often enough, you get a lot of opportunities to see different aspects of the landscape. And then again, um, the foreground, a mess, the background, uh, this one in particular with the church, hope that provides, uh, again, a type of hope of what might be attainable uh, far away. And then, So that's, um, that's my series uh, and publication for Middle Ground. Uh, so before taking questions, just like you know that uh, it's been fortunate to be exhibited, um, Jerry Klausing, 
He's done an excellent job of writing a book review about this on Photobook Journal. Aline Smithson uh, also did an interview and in, in discussion of this book on Lens Scratch. Um, it's for sale at Arcana Book of the Arts in Culver City, Enzenberg uh, Gallery Bookshop in Vienna, Austria, uh, Grenade in the Jar in Santa Fe, and International Photo Books in LA. And last but not least, it's in the collection of the Frisk um, Fine Arts uh, Library at the University of Pittsburgh, and also at the Photographer's Eye Gallery Bookshop uh, uh, Book Gallery down in Escondido, California. Okay, uh, how are we doing? I think we're doing good for time. So questions and answers. Why don't you stop sharing? Oh, do you want me to stop sharing? Okay. There you go. I thought it was I thought it was a good good time for people to take notes on my website. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was it was a subtle it was a subtle uh, sales opportunity, Jim. Thanks for that. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, you know, um, you showed at the uh, exchange photo exchange. You showed some work you've done with um, travel through airports. Yep. Um, and um, you intimated uh, that uh, it, it was it was related to your anxiety also. Is, am I correct on that? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I thought it, I, I, I really liked uh, I like both of them. I th think um, uh, it's an interesting way to um, bring out the, um, you know, mental health, which is a, a big deal today. I mean, people are talking about it a lot trying to get over the uh, stigma of it. Um, so I, I think you did a good job on, on this. Oh, thanks, Jim. Yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, definitely second thoughts as to revealing the personal side of what's kind of driving uh, something like a, a project like this. But I've also come to understand that I think it's uh, just as you see people uh, elsewhere who reveal their traumas and problems, whether that's uh, uh, breast cancer or what have you, that it's, it, by my talking about it, might help somebody else. So it's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out there and kind of open the kimono and reveal something very personal, but uh, it, ideally it will help with uh, making a connection. Uh, just one thing, Doug, in your case, do not open the kimono. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> well, re uh, uh, revelations are always interesting, uh, even though they might be shocking. And I, I find it very interesting that you came up with this additional understanding of what these barriers might represent because the physical barriers uh, and the psychological meanings that are behind them and that they can represent it's a very very big subject and you know uh, a lot has been made in recent years of differences between people and things that can separate people, especially by the politicians. And I have written repeatedly about how important it might be to see similarities and shared features and to do collaboration and so on. And this kind of book, and including the one that you've written about your travels, business travels, can contribute toward getting people to realize to overcome these barriers. So I think it's wonderful and congratulations for also allowing this personal component of yours to come into this discussion. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Yeah. So, yeah, what, when I, 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 just another little side, when I was um, thinking of reintroducing this book under this new context, uh, I had actually dealt with uh, Andrea Smith. She's a book PR person uh, in New York City and mm. uh, very, you know, she had worked with Aperture for a number of years in public relations 
And now she does a lot of work uh, with individuals and other publishers uh, to help with their books. And so when I approached her about relaunching this book, she's like, uh, that's, that's, that that's, can be problematic. It's a lot of people are interested in today's, you know, the latest, latest book off the press. So a lot of the pub, a lot of people that cover photo books uh, have some issues. But so when I brought in how both um, this is a, an outcome of the pan, pandemic, as well as how i uh, kind of inspired by Simone Biles, she said, you know what, this is something maybe worth bringing forward and into both Jim and Jerry's points, uh, putting this in the context of how we might deal with anxiety might be a, a, a powerful message. So thanks to Michael for uh, the opportunity to talk more about this in terms of uh, re relaunching this, this book. And yeah, Jim. Oh, I, I was just to say, um, on making the book, uh, you, you indicated that you, you know, I, I, I traveled the San Diego freeway, so I know what the stop and um, go is <laughs> like. When, when, when you first said that, I thought, oh my God, is he stupid? But then I realized, you know, I mean, who stops on a freeway, right? But then you said San Diego freeway. It's like, so I, you know, I can relate to that. Um, but, you know, you can, um, there are, uh, there's equipment that you can put in your car uh, and have a camera on it pointed out the window. And, um, and, and you can video or you can take individual photos, you know, remotely, you know, with a remote release or whatever. Have you ever thought of doing something like that if you ever decided to do another series like this? Well, actually, I have one that's downstairs in my uh, equipment room if you'd like to borrow it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in fact, uh, because one of the things I was thinking about when I initially did this back in 2017, working on this project, uh, I had thought, okay, what would be really cool is to actually create a video of this with my 5D Mark III. So that's part of why I acquired it and set it up and try to do the filming. And um, that's when I became quite acutely aware that I'm not a video person because uh, you, you really, really, really got to get the horizon correct and uh, a number of other factors. Uh, I've got a couple versions that are close, but uh, no, they all need some serious editing. And, and quite honestly, I realize it's, it's tough to drive and manage the camera at the same time. So it's like, okay, this, this isn't working out. But by the way, um, back in 2020, uh, most of the landscape in that middle ground you see has all been eliminated. Uh, they widened the San Diego freeway and big chunks of the oleander are actually now gone. So uh, as, as someone told me down in San Diego and at, at, the, at the gallery in Escondido, I was like, okay, this, this has now become an historical project because what you're looking at can no longer, it, it's gone. It's all been changed and modified as a result of widening the freeway. I wonder if they were worried about lawsuits, people chomping on, on those leaves and, and blossoms and putting them in their salad and so on. I, very rarely do people stop in the middle of a freeway to gather uh, pretty flowers. So yeah. uh, it's, it's actually a very, it's used as a decorative botanical um, in Northern California, up in Oregon, uh, out in Texas. I mean, it's used quite frequently in the middle median where people aren't supposed to be. But yeah, you, they're dangerous. Yeah, they're dangerous well, they, you remember they, they had uh, fleeing, uh, you know, uh, border crossing signs type things and people crossing the freeway in the old days and those signs are gone. I'm somewhat facetious about these comments, but still, you know, 
uh, uh, nowadays everybody's worried about everything, so anxiety is rampant. And I think it'd be important to come to terms with that and overcome some of these anxieties and settle back to having a country that's more decent. Uh, that's, I mean, that's just my personal view. But, but I, you know, these freeways were not exactly all that beautiful, uh, even when they had the barriers and the oleander. Well. In fact, actually, uh, when they did the decoration uh, and put in the oleander uh, in the middle, uh, in the middle of the median, that was actually a response and funded uh, in the nineteen sixties. Lady Bird uh, and <laughs> President Johnson. No, they they came up with how to beautify freeways. Yes, a beautification yeah. program. They got funding. San Diego got funding through that in order to put it in place. Plus, it really was something that was a win-win for them because of that being the vacation. And you would see this beautiful uh, flowering plants as you came into San Diego. And so it was part and parcel of their tourism that they sure, were hoping sure. to but, work with. Yeah, they also gave people jobs to uh, you know, work on the beautification. And that obviously was no longer the case because we see much debris lying around in your photographs, which is actually an interesting thing about the deterioration of some of the attitudes of people also. Well, I, and I understand. And I think that, because, you know, again, when you do research on um, your subject and I came to find out that they've been talking about this freeway, freeway widening program mm -hmm. for the better part of four years, because when they initially were talking about widening the freeway, uh, a bunch of folks in North San Diego County didn't want the oleanders to be taken out. <laughs> so there was, so there was, so I think in retrospect, the county wasn't maintaining this area. They weren't right. keeping it clean. They were keeping the plants alive. If the, if the plant were uh, destroyed as a result of a car accident because a car burned and the plants got ruined, uh, they weren't really inclined to want to go back and replace those because essentially they were thinking they were all going to be gone anyhow. So I, I think I just took advantage of what they were allowing to occur. Because there's a lot of debris that, you know, hubcaps and tires, mm -hmm. parts and all sorts of crap that mm -hmm. is along there. But it was but it worked fine for me because it helped yeah. with <laughs> with with um, creating an illusion of, OK, a lot of debris and, and issues and problems. So, mm -hmm. so it worked to my advantage. Very good. Um, Doug, who came up with the idea of um, making an accordion book? Ah, thank you. Uh, that was twofold. When I uh, when I pre visualized this book, um, I one uh, thought of how Ed Rushka's uh, every building in the Sunset Strip, that famous accordion book he built and made back in the nineteen sixties, mm -hmm. was along the same idea of a serial part of the freeway because it, it does start at the beginning and go towards the end. So there's that serial aspect. And then also, um, I like the idea that of trying to create a through line, not only of the subject, but if you look at the top of the K rail, they are, it's a continuous line as you open the book. So as you, so I have a through line that that worked very well with the idea of an accordion book because it actually opens up to 21 feet and that's the length of a K rail. So there's another subtlety as the book design is how it reflects the subject. In fact, actually, one of my crazy ideas, uh, and I try to talk uh, Chris Davies into this at, at Fabric is when I had the exhibit, is I wanted them to bring in an old K rail into the gallery. But, uh, one uh, size to the door and the cotton pick and weight. And anyhow, I would, because I, I thought it would be really cool to have the K rail uh, inside the gallery with the exhibit. So uh, it was, to me, it was just the whole idea of, of how Rushka 
was because he actually you know did the same thing he put a motorized camera and he drove down sunset to take the pictures and so th to me it was very uh symbolically and and very similar the other the other side of that is i was also inspired uh by uh uh Vernon hiller beecher mm -hmm. the uh german artist who had the same subject but repeating and so again it's not as as closely aligned with their work but it's the idea of the repetition of a similar spot on the on the freeway that's repetitive and that you would have a tendency to want to try to compare like pictures together but thanks Tim. Um, yeah uh, um so this type of book is a specialty um i mean it's not your standard book so did, did you how did you find uh the right the you know the right um, the right bookmaker uh that was easy i did it oh you did it i printed the book um commercially through um dual dual graphics which is here in orange county and because of the uh, um so i would print off commercially three page panels that I in turn would glue together. So I set up a small assembly binding area in my living room and that I would then glue the 11 panels together to actually create the accordion book. So it's they're very expensive and very difficult to do, but it's essentially hand bound by me. Very good. So that's so that's uh, the when I approached a bindery, they said, oh yeah, we, we'll tape it all together, but I've had troubles with, in my collection, tape books in the past. And I asked for it to be uh, glued with PVC glue. And they were like, uh, that's messy and not a problem. So as a result, I found out they were right. So I have a lot of um, uh, review copies <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that I created. Cause there's nothing worse than on the 10th panel you screw something up and make a mess. And it's like, well, one more for uh, the review pile. So I have a big pile of review copies. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like a, like a monk making a, an illuminated manuscript. Just, yeah. just one letter screw up and start all over again. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, that's the case with this, but yeah. Uh, so these, once, when, when they're ordered then it's a special it's basically a special order i mean you have to make yeah. it yourself yeah okay. yeah it's the, there's some folks that will take it on but boy the the the, the price or cost that they're going to charge you is is pretty steep right only because only because of the error rate it, it, it it's just it's just really troublesome to make so anyhow i did get some coaching from some people who had already made a an accordion book in the past and they told me you know the, the tabs for binding make them a little wider than you might think otherwise so that you've got uh, plenty of space and allow yourself plenty of time and room so um this took the entire span of my dining room and living room and i had a whole series of tables set up so that as i walked through the process of binding i took care of it so i could only bind like two or three maybe four a day i mean it it it, it was uh the binding process took me about two months which means we didn't use the living room or dining room for two months because <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay i'm not going to set this up every day to do this and and one other question um and maybe you said and i missed it but you said you printed three, three pages at a time. Oh uh, yeah, the, uh, when you do a sheet, um, you can because the how large the printing sheet is, it uh, it allowed um, just a three-page panel. So you had all these repeats on a on a sheet, so that the sheet might have that picture series of three pictures panels. Um, going down the page 
So you'd have probably three rows. So when they printed it, they did the three three pages, but three rows at uh, three uh, three times on each sheet. So uh, it's also printed on one side. At the back side is blank. So that again helped a little bit with uh, how the presentation. Okay, so you didn't actually do the printing. You had a printer. Dual graphics. Yep. Okay. Oh, that's right. You said that. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and then yeah. also because of the nature of the fact that all these folds, uh, you have to have a paper that had uh, a certain type of fiber that um, is a matte paper and it's a, it's a lower weight. Um, it, it can't be glossy. So it's a, so it's a, it's a paper they make over in Italy, and uh, Dual Graphics had a lot of experience printing on this particular Italian paper, and as a result, the the, the images uh, we were thinking about maybe having a gloss spot afterwards, but um, it's it's a very uh, matte type paper and presentation. It's only from the standpoint that when you fold the pages back and forth for the accordion. If, if you don't have this really light paper, you start getting all the paper breaks. And if mm -hmm. you've ever taken a print be before and folded it, you can see the crack and you'll start to see little white specks along the uh, folded edge. So again, it's, it's um, anytime you see an accordion book, more times than not, it's, it's printed on this Italian paper uh, to just facilitate it. Again, it's a, it's a little tricks that you don't think about until you deal with a publisher who's done and printed a lot of books, who can tell you from past experience, you don't want to do that. This is what you want to do. And it's like part of the compromises of book design. And this is the, this is a segue for my book class, right, Michael? Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> In the original iteration of the book, did you write a statement? No. What, what, what was your expectation that the, re the viewer would have without a statement to guide them? Uh, I, tr I try to keep it more open-ended. Um, but like I said, I had this conceptual idea of what it was about. And I was concerned that if I wrote about one thing, it might limit how you would interpret the work. It's the whole thing today uh, for people who put captions in a book or captions in a print versus untitled. And so I was thinking that the untitled aspect of this book might um, give it more legs than if I tried to, to put a niche. And in retrospect, not having an essay and, and an introduction allowed me to rethink this today. So if I had printed something in there, uh, I'd, I'd have a hard time with uh, this being reissued as an, um, a reimagined landscape. Did the success of the book change when you inserted the new, the new statement? Uh, it's it's uh, it's gotten a lot of interest, and I'm starting to sell a lot of books. So yeah, it uh, people are really resonate now with how this landscape's been reimagined than than as much as it was before. Yeah, thanks. Do you, do you think that the current um, stress on um, mental health, the, it, its emphasis rather than stress on mental health yeah. uh, might have anything to do with uh, the increased sales? Um, potentially, but it was interesting. Um, when I first had the book, I exhibited it at uh, Photo Book Internet or Photography International, the uh, exhibit that was up in uh, up in LA, and I had a chance to have the book there and and spread out. And it was interesting that uh, two out of the three people who immediately purchased the book talked about how for them. Uh, it, it was more about the barriers they're having in their life and the things that they were overcoming. So I was already getting the message about how visually this represented something different than I anticipated, but I wasn't 
hearing their message. And it only was as I was rethinking this and understanding what my condition was and rethinking as to how this could represent other barriers that all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, people were telling me, but I just wasn't listening. You know, stupid. Yeah. So it, it goes to, you know, perception. Sometimes you, you keep trying to make a square peg go into a round hole. Yeah. But eventually you figure it out. And that's what I, and that to me, that's what's so cool about this is, um, and like I said, how it re re resonates with uh, Simone Biles is how this can be, have a second life. And to me, it's also as a photographer and something to uh, share with the, with the group is how you may be working in a project long-term and all of a sudden it's like, uh, you think it's one thing and then after a while you realize it's something else and how uh, as photographers, our work can be uh, really open to interpretation and uh, allow us to rethink what they could be and, and revitalize work, past work, and, and, and allow a chance to talk about things in terms of a new context. <clears throat> Well, I'm going to jump in here for a second. As you may or may not know, um, Douglas is conducting a workshop with the Southeast Center next month, uh, developing a creative book, photo book, uh, which sold out very quickly. So we're doing another session in January, which we just opened up to the world today. And you've probably got an email while you were sitting here. That <laughs> um, no, was intentional. <laughs> so this will be this will be the third class. Well, second here, second second with LCs. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I've previously taught this workshop with LACP and as well okay. as Medium Photo. Yeah. Right. So was, this is the third. You were right in one respect. This is the third organization that, uh, especially first East Coast organization, to uh, have an opportunity to do the workshop, which has been really really well received. Yeah. And these are Zoom. These are virtual. Yeah, these are uh, Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. The, initially, yeah. they were face-to-face, uh, um, -face, mm -hmm. but with the pandemic, we transitioned to a Zoom. And now I think we've uh, found that, that continuing to do this on Zoom, and I figured out a, a good way to uh, help people work and develop their book on Zoom. It's become very powerful. You know, I think... Uh, even for the Southeast, there's folks on the, the East Coast, but there's also Midwest and West Coast that are joining in, just yes. like I had for my other workshops where it's West Coast time, but uh, at least a third of the workshop is from outside the area. Yeah, well, the, the Zoom certainly opens up your, your, your broadens your market, your audience. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yep. So that's that's very cool. Yeah, for me, it, and the pushback initially was, uh, what about a book object? That's that's kind of hard to do virtually. But then, and I really think about it, uh, what photographer doesn't have like a ton of books anyhow? So it's not like uh, I I my library looks different than your library, and I can pull those books out and bring them out and share those with folks as an example, but uh, just about everybody has a ton of photo books that they can go back to and think about as terms of, okay, this is kind of like how I'm pre-visualizing mine to look like this. Very good. So if nobody has anything else for Douglas today, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you um, all. Appreciate it very, very much. And of course, the last plug, I still have a few copies available if you're interested. There you go. So next month, November 20th, um, on a lighter note, perhaps, we have Jim Ferguson, Jim Ferguson's Deflated Christmas. So just in time for the holidays. Cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Lydia Panis and her Sleeping Beauty. Oh, cool. So awesome. hopefully we'll see you next month.
And thanks for coming by. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Thank you. It was very interesting.